described Justice Vagtajalaya as that great jurist of light and learning. I have had the good fortune of knowing him and learning at his feet for four decades now. He is a walking encyclopedia on law. You see, you get lawyers who are specialists in a particular field. Any field of law you ask, Justice Vagtajalaya will be able to talk, will be able to write, will be able to guide. My brother had that brain as his weapon and he sharpened it, honed it by reading books, by studying and he became one of the best in whatever subject he was dealing. Whenever you meet him, you will be elevated, you will be enlightened. Every meeting you will come as a better human being and you will leave his abode touching his feet. The man was full of grace and competence, scholarship, or oh, very independent, maintained the integrity of the office very high. There are many chief justices who fade away after retirement. Justice Venkatchela has certainly not faded away. He still remains very active at this age of something like 93 years. Everything about childhood is interesting. In the sense, we were a middle class family and the um, neighborhood was all middle class. Life was uneventful, excepting when we got into the Second World War started. There was uh, some deprivations. Even fuel for firewood was rationed. We would go and wait near shops, collect our rations and all that. All of us were cricket fans. But somehow my elder brother had that kind of leadership right from an engage. We used to follow him and he was the one who would dictate who should play what, who should stand where. When Tajale was not a fashionable or flamboyant lawyer, he was a sound lawyer, very deeply rooted in legal theory and legal philosophy. In fact, he would say that his father was really a legal philosopher. I greatly profited from his meticulous notes. He was a case which I thought was impossible. The client was saying, no sir, your father was not pessimistic about it. Please look into it. And then I saw in this one small sentence, that turned the whole thing. The case turned on the, oh, the fundamental was different. Victor Jalea's maternal grandfather, uh, Balepur Subarna, was a judge of the High Court, then known as the Mysore Chief Court. Victor Jalea, as a young boy, this is what I've heard from him, and was asked to read the leader in the Hindu every day to the grandfather. And he would be given some small pocket money, one anna or something in those days. And if he faltered in his pronunciation or intonation, there would be a tap on the head. So that's perhaps the way the young boy was tutored and inculcated into reading and learning. Those were very gracious days and leisurely times. Society didn't have to face the kind of challenges that it has to face today. People who have known him even in those days always remember him as a marked man. Not someone who reaped rich harvests in, this, in terms of money. In any case, I returned the fee. In one case, I returned. I told him I worked three days. You give me my fee, 3,000. He had put in 30 or 35,000 in the place. I returned it. Whether you write pleadings or you write judgments, you see the man in it. And I could always make out his from his judgments, even without the name. And I have asked him this. I said, whose judgment is that? He said, it's the court's judgment. I confess I am guilty. I said, yes, because the language bats it out. Very distinguished career as a judge. First year, Karnataka High Court, then in the Supreme Court. On the eve of his elevation to the Supreme Court, where uh, the then law minister, Mr. Shiv Shankar, had uh, met him at a wedding uh, reception. And he said, the Prime Minister must also know whom he is appointing. It's the procedure that you should call on the Prime Minister. Victor Dele, I think, was hearing such a thing for the first time in his life. He said, I'm sorry, but I'm not in the habit of 
meeting anyone, leave alone the Prime Minister, with whom I have no work. He even said, caution, that I might be putting my appointment at stake. I told him I don't have the impertinence to interfere with the course of providence. If that happens, it will be for the good of the country. So shall I convey this to the Prime Minister? Please do convey to the Prime Minister the exactly the same words. I understand the Prime Minister felt happy and conveyed to the Attorney General, Mr. Parasharan. He said, Rajiv Gandhi sent for me, Prime Minister, and told me I am proud to be a Prime Minister of a country. There are still judges like this. Kindly announce his name today before he withdraws his consent. You would notice that in many of the important judgments, the law and its development is traced very neatly, very elegantly. See, Antule case is bereft of, uh, of personalities. We are not. The question is the principle of finality. He put questions to Mr. Ram Jethmalani, the presiding judge. Yes, Subhishachi Mukherjee says Venkatajale was number six in, on that bench. Turned round and told him, if your lordship is answering the questions, I will reframe them and put it to you. These questions are meant for counsel to answer. They went on a larger philosophical issue of jurisdiction, which was, uh, to my mind, pushed to a little uh, higher extent than it was the tensile strength of the argument bore. Mr. Nariman himself has also told me this. His courtroom was like a classroom where you did get education. It is said that wherever Napoleon stood, that's the center of the battlefield. Wherever Venkatajalaya sat, whether as judge number seven or judge number four or judge number three, that was the center of the bench. And that, this was on the eve of his taking over as chief justice and said, and he said, now of course, the center is rightfully is as he takes over as the chief justice of India. The great gentleman, Nazim Rao, just the previous day before the new Chief Justice is sworn in, the outgoing and the incoming Chief Justices are entertaining dinner. He said, Chief Justice, you will find my relationship with you cordial. I told him, the Chief Justice and the Prime Minister on cordial terms should not be in the interest of democracy. I expect our relationship to be proper. There may be many such instances, but I am aware of one, and which again I have heard from him. Old Sardarji in Delhi, standing at the door of the Chief Justice's court one late one afternoon. You see, the question was he had not taken a license. He had put up a, put up a building. Soon thereafter, the counsel for the Delhi Municipal Corporation appeared and resisted all that, saying, and of course, the judge, Chief Justice, reminded him that there's nothing new, there's already a case way back in 1956, Supreme Court, where if you have the lesser of the two evils, discretion, you must exercise your discretion in choosing the lesser. But if you can compound this, you don't have to pull down, you take whatever compounding fine. So the law was laid, the man got relief, and as Justice Krishna had said, this is what we call a judge's compassion. You don't look at your mind, you look at the mind of that man and say whether his apprehension is reasonable. It may not be real, whether for him it is a reasonable apprehension. That's the test. I personally think Justice Venkatchalaya's contributions to improving the speed of dispute resolution have been phenomenal. Justice Venkatchalaya's fame rests not so much on innovation, but on consolidation and building. The very first thing I did was to appoint the Ahmedabad Institute of Management to study the case flow management and advise us how international institutions are working, similar institutions, and how we should upgrade our methods. It reforms at the subordinate courts, the district courts level, which is ultimately that's the real place where people come in touch with the judiciary. The pendency there was brought down remarkably. At the time when Chief Justice Venkatchalaya was the Chief Justice, if my memory serves me right, the backlog had been reduced to something like 28,000. It has crept back up again. Cases are pending for 15 years, where it should not be pending for more than 15 months. It could all be streamlined if you take one strong look at it and say which part of our procedure is judicial which is purely administrative and managerial in nature, which can be handled to systems experts. 
and the pure judicial side could be handled by the judges themselves. He has always been concerned about human rights, which is sometimes something generally neglected. And he brought that lens of human rights, he brought that lens of human development in everything that he has done, whether it's the Human Rights Commission or the Constitution Review Commission or what he's done subsequently. I got a call from the chairman of the National Human Rights Commission. He said, I want you to come as Director General in the National Human Rights Commission. Then I told him, this is what the Principal Secretary to the Prime Minister has said. They are sending me as ambassador. And he asked me not to commit myself to anything. He said, what is their ambassadorship? You will fly flag and that huge... But here we can do something substantive to this country. Human rights are in under stress here. In the Human Rights Commission, we have gone into these kind of uh, traumatic uh, situations. For example, affirmative action commences from the stage of fetal nutrition. Because the two things, vastness of the problem, hugeness of the problem, administration has not devolved itself into coherent, concentrated action. And third is misleading statistics. These three things are the bane of this country. The UN Commissioner for Human Rights said that uh, India, under his uh, chairmanship of the NHRC, showed how even with or without provisions in the charter or the enactment, how with the correct people at the help of FS, human rights become meaningful. And that is what is his deep philosophical principle, which is also reflected in what, is, what he has done post-retirement in Bangalore, whether it is with the Sri Sattasai Institute, whether it is with the Public Affairs Center, whether it is with the Foundation. Sri Venkatachalaji has inspired and motivated and led the Samatvam Trust to launch successfully four projects for the poor and needy people with diabetes and related problems. When I spoke to him about it, he was the first one to provide me a substantial amount of donation to the Trust. Samatvam in the last three decades has touched the life of more than 1.5 lakhs people with diabetes and other problems. Most of the judges, for example, after retirement, they take an assignment. He said, no, I have been the Chief Justice of India. After holding that post, I will not go and take any work for which uh, payment is going to. My pension, I will leave my, uh, on my pension. This is Ravindran told me that, and I agree. He said, Sudesh, his house in Baskudi is an open house. I said, yes, very true. And he himself calls it a free legal aid clinic. I was walking down the corner of the road. Just near the corner, there was a, like a middle-aged uh, woman from the village. So she comes up to me and says, uh, there is an old man here who gives free advice and justice. Where is he? Where can I meet him? That was one of the most touching moments for me. He has a kind of spiritual reverence. Anybody who is in contact with him, it rubs off on you. He came to see me with my sister's house. So, so some a brother of his but he told me to sing a song. So I sang this song. Madhava Mamava Deva Krishna Yadava Krishna Yadukula Krishna Madhava Mamava Deva she was an extraordinary person. I didn't know she. Was, she also came from a, a small family, like us, a middle class family. But uh, she was uh, extremely 
spiritual person as it turned out in later life i have to help him but now he in his old age but he gets up early morning and gives me very very good coffee i will take on the bed itself and i enjoy it that is tablets also very very regularly he gives water and tablet one common thing every time i used to tell when i came back from school i was talking about success career uh, you know jobs money and all that he would say what is the qualification to be the lord chancellor of england then uh, i would say what he say first thing you should be a gentleman it doesn't matter if you know a little law so he always focused on being a gentleman helping others tata really loves me and ever since i was little he's been playing with me and i enjoy playing chess with him he's really smart and i i can't beat him most of the time whenever i have any doubts he instantly gives me the solution and i always look forward to having deep conversations with him usually when we have a meal together and i feel that it really helps me a lot i am personally grateful to god for the long innings that he gave me but when i reflect upon the predicament of our society and fellow men it looks as if we collectively as a nation and as a people could have done much better but at the same time i've seen so much of graciousness so much of kindness so much of consideration among human beings the man was as great as the judge and for years and years to come memory will hold back the door and those who have the had the good fortune of knowing him in whatever manner appearing for him sitting with him talking to him would always remember his great magnanimity and unfeigned humility is the definition of what a judge should be which is difficult for most of us shri venkata chala ji is children grandchildren great grandchildren of samatvam of all over the world we worship the dust of the lotus feet of honorable shri venkata chalaya so he is our god living god on earth story of such a person should be told that today people are losing values they should know a man such as this still exists a banyan tree shelters so has he all those who have come in touch with him had contact with him have learned have grown and have transformed that i think is his true greatness the sanskrit shloka says that a, a tree like a banyan tree is completely selfless it stands there in the heat provides shade to others and is not in the business of proclaiming its existence nor does it proclaim what it is doing for others it is happy just providing shade and shelter to others so that is why i think the image of that uh, banyan tree is so very apt because one of the things um, that distinguishes just as venkatachalaya and probably distinguishes all banyan trees is the strong sense of humility trees provide fruit for everyone and in all their selflessness do not consume the fruit themselves they provide shade to everyone and selflessly endure the heat themselves the banyan tree's selflessness is a great metaphor for justice m n venkatachalaya a towering personality who lived a life of selflessness and he deserves a gratitude and a resounding applause